Hi, everyone. Hi, teammates all around the world, wherever you're watching from. Thank you for joining the Eurostep, where we try to look in at the behind the scenes of European basketball, not just European basketball, but basketball in Germany in, in general. And um, I like to have different different guests on and tell their story, tell their their truth. And that's what we're doing tonight as well. Before I begin, make sure you guys look at the bottom of the screen. Um, at the comment section, you can um, ask a question that everybody will see in the chat. Or if you just want me to see it, hit the question mark with the speech bubble and I'll only see it and I'll try to infuse your questions in as we go through the episode. Thank you for everyone that's joined. Um, I see the new people jumping in right now. Thank you from where wherever you are all around the world. I appreciate you if you're only here for a second or if you're here for the whole hour. Thank you. So, yeah, let's get started, man. Um, it's my my goal with this podcast to inform, entertain, and inspire. That's why I do this. And if you're not inspired by hearing the story you're about to hear, then then um, then this is the wrong place for you. Sergio Cruz is a talented basketball player, but not only that, he's also the life of the party. Um, he's beloved, um, but he's also had his low points, and, and that's what um, we want to get to as well as his basketball journey. So let's just get started. Thank you, Sergio, for coming on. I really appreciate you. I know you had practice tonight, so you probably know uh, the time. Good, man. We just finished practice, so yeah, we good. I got an hour for you, and then I'm going to go ahead and call it a night. Okay, let, then let's let's get it let's get it started. Um, here's how the interview will go. Just um, my, I'm not I'm not looking for uh, what are they called uh, all kind of crazy uh, crazy quotes and shit like that. Just speak your truth, man. Whatever you feel comfortable with talking about, then do so. There's no time limit on your answers. I'm not into interrupting my guests. Just speak your truth and and um, and let's have a good one, man. Let's do it. Okay, so let's go. Let's go way back. Let's go all the way back to your JUCO season. Um, we we both know that JUCO. I, I also went to a JUCO for one year. We both know that JUCO is a different breed, right? Um, yeah. Because everybody has the same goal. Everybody's trying to get that D one. Everybody's trying to get that scholarship. So it's 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 a different kind of kind of thing going to a, a JUCO. Would you look back on it and think that um, that JUCO kind of prepared you for your professional life as well? Well, I mean, it's, I went to a great JUCO. I went to Itawamba in Mississippi. Shout out to Itawamba and Jay Hayes and them. Um, it was in uh, Mississippi. It was Itawamba, Mississippi, and it was a dry county. Nothing but basketball. <laughs> Talking about you had to share a room. Girls couldn't come into the dorm. <laughs> uh, you had to stick. It was in your room. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, and I was an under, undersized center. I was a center all the way up until. You were a center uh, in JUCO? 19th in the nation at center. Wow. Uh, back in the day. But um and I ended up finishing that year. We finished third place. We lost to Chipola and Hutch. Um we had like a thirty four and two record, one of the I think the best in the history of it, Awamba. And um, you know, it, it it prepared me in a sense of I had a great coach in Coach Cooper and Coach Alexander, if they're listening, I had great coaches in those guys and I was prepared for my high school coaches, Coach Shaq and uh, Woods. And, uh, you know, like, they just – they basically were like, you know, you got talent. You have a motor. I wasn't good at basketball. I was an actor. Uh, I was in Cabo Drama. <laughs> over the high school, I was going to be an actor. I, you know, somebody <laughs> – you know, you, all my guys who aren't here, they know, they know how I am personally, so they know I was an actor. But, um, you know, uh, you know, he told me you got a motor. He said you got a motor, and they just – just get the rebounds and put them back. Didn't shoot a three in JUCO. Didn't shoot a three wow. in high school. First three came in college. And, uh, man. It was tough. Like, like you had to really be motivated on just basketball to live in Itawamba, Mississippi at that time. <laughs> you know, back woods place. Like the parties we went to were in barns. So wow. you know, only Dodge's chicken. Uh, so you know, just <laughs> you had to separate yourself from all the other mess and just you know go basketball. So right. It, 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 aspect prepare me for my professional professional career like my overseas career because you all you had was basketball right yeah so. um and what i mean at what point you said you, you you said that you weren't really good at basketball back then you were an actor at what point in your college career did you think okay maybe i maybe i can go overseas and play well shoot i mean shoot, my uh Junior year, excuse my language. Sometimes I cuss. My no, junior no year, no problem. 
I was ranked on the draft list. I was the number seven best small forward in the, in the world at the time. It was only DJ Kennedy and Kyle Singler above me. And I was on Yahoo Sports in the, in the, in the mock drafts and all that stuff. Um, but like, I really thought I could make a living for it around that time because we played in the – we played some of my – I said 11th grade year, my junior year in college. We played in the, um, what is it called? You get to play in New York, oh, NIT, NIT preseason. NIT, right. uh, I averaged 25 and eight at small fort during the whole term all the way to the last round. And that's when I was like, okay, I can do something special. Um, and it was a lot of hype coming around because we'd be in LSUs playing North Carolina. As we, we knocked uh, Louisville from the third third seed back to the 22nd seed. Like, we were special. My whole group is really good. Uh, AJ Slaughter right now plays for Poland. Uh, just oh, made yeah. history. With Jeremy Evans, dunk champion. Uh, shout out to him. NBA Jazz. Stefan Pettigrew played out there for a while. Uh, and uh, OMV, Orlando Mendez Valdez, who was the, is the captain of the Mac, uh, Mexico national team. Like, we had a real deal squad back in the day. And uh, Cliff Dixon, R.I.P., you know, he's Kevin Durant's half-brother. He got shot, love him to death, uh, miss him. But, yeah, like, that was the first time I really realized, okay, this might be able to make me some money. And, you know, and then I, I got German citizenship because my father's full-blooded German. Yeah, and, I was uh, just about to ask you about that. It went like that. Dad's full-blooded German. He don't speak a lick of German now, though. He's been in the ghetto too long. You got to forgive him. <laughs> ghetto too long. Fine. But... but but uh yeah but full blooded German and I got a German passport when uh when did you get, I'm sorry, when did you get the German passport? Were you still in college before you mm -mm, or, or? I got my second year professional because my first year I went oh, really? to uh I went to Greece. Remember I went right. to Aries in Greece. Right. And uh my, I just talked about you, Pet. Uh I was just giving you a shout out. That was that was my four man in college. Boy is built like a he lifts school buses for weights. <laughs> but yeah, so uh got it my my first year out of uh out of Aries because they wanted me to come to the German League and they wanted me to play for Bamberg actually. Chris Fleming hit me up, brought me in the summer with PJ Tucker and them. And uh, you know, and they, they were like, you know, we're gonna get your passport because you are German. Right. And it helped a lot with my career because everyone's not fortunate enough to be able to have a, a passport, you know? And that's one thing that's really European guys because that raises your stock once you have a, right. a passport yeah so. what did you know about european basketball when you were think back to when you were a senior in college before you came over to, to greece what did you what did you understand about european basketball uh nothing you know like even looking back <laughs> that, is, that is such a common answer <laughs> like, i like i go back to my box sometimes because i had euro league contracts and i took euro cup contracts and no one never really told me the, the Euro League stamp is going to keep you in the Euro League, just like the Euro Cup stamp keeps you in the Euro Cup. Like, you, I didn't know that. All I knew was I'm a young black kid out of North Memphis, where a lot of people, number one Myrtle capital, you know what I'm saying, in Memphis, and, and I love my city. But all I knew was, you know, get out of the hood, make some money, get your family out the hood. So I didn't make the wisest business decisions because I'm going to say this, and, and I hope it doesn't offend anyone, but if it does, hey, I'm sorry, I'm me. Um... Growing up as a black person, we're not used to wealth. So once we get some, we sometimes don't know how to manage it. Right. So my first years attaining wealth as a black person, I didn't know how to manage it. I was buying the brand new cars, the brand new this, but nothing that had any value. Oh, yeah. And now I'm getting back to making money. But at the same time, it took me blowing for those two years. So uh, I, knew, I knew nothing about Europe. Like, I didn't even know how it was. Funny story. Bamberg brought me out right out of college. This is, this is so funny. This is why I didn't sign with Bamberg. And this is an exclusive story <laughs> I'm telling you. They, offered me yeah. <laughs> they flew me in for two weeks. And I worked out with Chris Fleming in the day. They were going to try to make me a double licensed player. And they were the, that's the, when they were on their EuroLeague run. They were owning Germany at the time. PJ Tucker was on there. Uh, Ron Williams, but they, they wanted me to sign. Because uh, I just, like, they had Kyle Hines the year before in my position who's the legend out here, you know, Kyle Hines yeah. is a legend. Um, but I pulled up, and this is back when, uh, was it, my space was popping. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I pulled up to him, man, and I didn't know about the converters for your, for your stuff that for you got to have. Yeah, electric, electronics, so, yeah. I used to spend, I was like, my whole two weeks there, I spent, I didn't know everything was closed on Sunday, so I spent, 
my two weeks in there, like on the computer in like the the uh, lobby of the hotel, I was trying to send my mom MySpace messages to tell her I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Sunday, I called the guy who was managing uh who was managing Bamberg at the time, and it was a Sunday. And I'm like, man, I'm hungry. I ain't ate. You know, this is boom. He's like, well, I'm out with my friends. I'm like, oh, see. And I he he left me to hang at Bamberg, so I went down to the bar. And I, I didn't drink at the time. I ordered like five bottles of wine, <laughs> charged it to the room, and I just poured it. And I was like, all right, y'all want to play? We're going to play. But, you know, that's that's me being young. Like, a lot of guys don't have that guidance because nowadays, well, nowadays, the spotlight is being shown more on Europe than back yeah. in the day. Years ago, everyone yeah. thought that Europe was where the people who weren't good enough for the NBA exactly. went. But people don't understand that Europe is one of the hardest places to score. I've had NBA teammates. Some of them struggle out here. You know, it's just just about where you personally fit in. You know, it's a it's a different game. And hence, let me do my shameless book, uh, my shameless book promotion. Same name, different game. It's a different game over here, man. And that's why that's why I, I wrote the book because, like you said, a lot of people they don't they don't understand. That there's some killers out here, man. There are just it's not you can't play in the NBA. But people don't understand. Dennis Schroeder, I knew him when he was a young guy coming up out here. Uh, Daniel Theis, um, Malcolm Delaney played out here. Greg Monroe played out here. I played in the BBL for so 13 years. It's one of the top level leagues. Like a lot of these yeah. guys, that, like Bill Killian Hayes, like all these guys that are going to the NBA, Luka Doncic, he was 17, 18 out here. And now look yeah. at him in the NBA, MVP, killing people. So you got to understand, like, it just, Certain like out here is really tough to score. You're not if you're in a high level league, it's tough to say you're gonna come in average a twenty point ten game Thank because you. they don't they care about winning, you know. And everyone mm -hmm. like like me, I found my niche in averaging my eight points a game in fifteen minutes and five rebounds or whatever. But people don't understand about I'm about to go out there and kill. And it's different levels to overseas too. Now, granted, if you're doing what you're doing, it's a blessing that you're out here playing because a lot of people that don't have jobs, mm -hmm. but. When you come into that gym on your off season and you tell them you played seventeenth league Uganda <laughs> and you <laughs> have a problem, so for sure, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. So, um, so you you came to Germany in in twenty twenty one and never mm -hmm. left. No, wait, not twenty twenty one. Twenty thirteen, twenty twelve, twenty twelve. Oh, I 20. reverse the numbers. Twenty twelve and haven't left. Besides the mm -hmm. fact that that that. This is your father's birth country. Um, what's kept you here so long? Um, man, I went through some hardships. Like, my career has been through a lot of stuff. And what kept me here was, well, the last team I've been with, I'm with them now, the one that I set all the records with, and I'm the current leading scorer, and I'm only adding to it. Um, it's just the love of the people. I found my place. Like, I found my niche, and I found my place where I was loved, and I could be me. And people accept me for me. Like, 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 just like in the NBA, it's all about you can be a greatest player ever. But if you're not in the right place, no one will ever see you shine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's the tough part about overseas because I've ran into so many different coaches that didn't understand me. Even now I have a coach that doesn't understand me as well. But, you know, like, <laughs> run into them and, and something got to give. Either you got to give or they got to give, you know. And uh, I just found my place to where the fans love me enough and the sponsors, Dennis and Claudia and them, they were there. Um, but, uh, you know, the fans love me enough to where I felt home. Like, I've had the same apartment for six years. I, I, I found me a place, you know, yeah. home outside of home with friends. So, you know, I've just been kicking it, man. I'm blessed to do it. They're retiring my jersey this year, so. It's crazy, you know, man, because what you just said, I – that's exactly one of my my next question would have been as an outsider and observer of the game it seems like you've you you never found your niche and found your groom, groove with other teams except for now in Weissenfels that's that's yeah. totally exactly what you said you you found your home you found your niche and you and you're running with it a lot of guys they don't they, they get impatient they think Okay, I gotta make this amount of money. I gotta do this. Sometimes it's about being being comfortable and having a good situation than trying to chase that almighty dollar. And a, a lot of people don't understand that. But but you know, like like one thing I will say, it wasn't easy. I'm a microwave, and I know what I'm capable of. I've always been. I've been a scorer since college. Like that's why I got the big jobs. I was 
and Aries, I made top five Bozeman's players of the year in the Euro Cup. And then, like, I was a killer. But when I got to Germany, when I played for Artland, uh, the rules were so strict. Germany's style of basketball is a lot different than Greece's. And they, they're very organized. They're very to the point. Like, you know, we want you to do one thing. Don't be you. And when I got to NBC, I had to break the mold. I had to force my will upon the mold. I was like, okay, this is the mold. But if I make shots, you can't tell me I'm wrong. So I shaped my career here because I got blackballed for a year. Uh, a lot of stuff happened in Arlen. I got blackballed for a year. Caught on fire from the neck down, tore my whole leg out, blew my whole leg out. We can get into that later. But when I when I came to um, Bison Fells, I just forced my way into it. Became a scoring machine. You know, um, went to the Pro A with them. Then moved up to the BBL and did the same thing in the BBL. 20, 20 minutes, 27, 29 points. 18 minutes, 27, like heating them up. Did about three years of that. Then people started being like, okay, he's different. You know, and then I'll get a coach who would give me away because he's seen me or played against me. He's like, okay, well, where did this surgery that was scoring go? And I was like, you got to accept my personality to get me to be the same on the court. Because sometimes my personality is too playful, too this. But you got to have something because when you're overseas, away from your family for nine months at a time, by yourself, anxiety and depression. If you really have anxiety and depression, which I do, it sets in. So you have to find some type of way to keep your light shining even when it's raining outside. An outlet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you, 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 I mean, you mentioned it before. I don't, I don't want to get too much into it. It's, it's on you. But you sat out the whole 15, 16 season mm. before signing, signing in, in Weissenfels for the 16, 17 season. They had just moved down to the second league. And I, I personally, when I was, when I was um, in Yena, um, we're going to get more to that in a second, but um, I was on a team that had just moved down. Mm. And the expectations are then to move right back up. So I know exactly what you were going through. Um, but it seems like at that point, you and NBC, it was a, a match made in heaven because you were out to prove after being out a year. They want to prove because they just moved down and want to move automatically back up for sure. Um, so it's kind of like the synergy was there for both you and for NBC. Is that how you feel about it? You know, that's the funny story, too. I wasn't going to go to NBC. I was going to Lutzburg. Lutzberg had offered me. The reason I took that year off was because I was recovering from the whole Arlen thing. I blew my whole knee out, tore everything in the ACL, MCL, PCL. The last two months of the season, I caught on fire. My GM didn't handle the situation uh, properly. We got into it, to it, like hands into it. Um, and, uh, you know, I came to Bremerhofen, first league, played in first league. They offered me a two-year contract under Malik Katzer to Sam Bremerhofen. At that point, I had to make a decision because I was only playing, what, 12 minutes in Bremerhofen. Even though I was playing well, I was only playing 12 minutes. And I felt like it was going to be the end of my career if I would have stayed stagnant. And I felt like if I would have went to Luthersburg, I would have been on the bench, you know what I'm saying, because I'm recovering, so I needed to play. In the German pro, you have a rule. The rule is two Germans must be on the court at all Same times. Time. Right. So with that being said, I knew I was going to log 25, 30 minutes. And I had to go out there and be like, all right, I need to play. Because I can't get better just watching practices and just sitting on the bench and doing that. So it was the perfect opportunity. Uh, Martin Geisler called me. Uh, he was like, yeah, you know, we're looking for this shit out. I heard you got a rocky pass and this, this, that, which I did at the time. I was, I was labeled a bad boy and the, the bad apple. Uh, and came out first game, 36. Then they were like, oh, okay, he's real. You know, after that, I was I was averaging 18 a game in, in pro A. So, what? you know. What? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Keep, keep going. Like, you, you just had to, like, you, you just had to, to put aside. Like, that's the one thing other guys mess up on, too. Like, we're having to talk about it. What's comfortable for you and then going with something new. Because sometimes when you go something new, which seems like more money, but it's not as good of a situation, that could be a last year plan. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that, that could definitely be a last. If you have a bad year, you get a hold of a coach that just doesn't like it. It doesn't have to be you. The coach just might not like your style of play or right. the, the type of person you are. But that could end your career. Because if you're out for a year, you know, it's almost death to a, a career. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you just think of how many careers Corona killed. Like, like it's, it's a lot of guys are home, you know. So, you know, I just called me up and uh, 
I talked to them and they told me what they were looking for and they said, we're going to give you a chance. And I said, I, I was working back then. I was working out with the NBA guys and stuff as always. And I was just like, watch, I'm I'm him. So came out here and I was blessed to have an amazing season and man, been stuck in the same spot ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how satisfying was it for you then to, to play on that NBC team with, that, that had moved from, from the pro a back to the bonus league. You guys won the title. Was it kind of a, a chip on my shoulder kind of moment? Like, okay, this is this is the real Sergio, and this is what I do. One thing I'll say is, I was a top player in the BBL for three or four years, and I'm still one of the top, if you ask me. Um, I feel like at my position, I never got the recognition I deserved in the BBL. But everyone knows me. Like, all the the top players know who I am. All the people when I know everyone knows me. But just from like the other sources. But it wasn't about, you know, um, that year I had a BBL team in the pro A. They had built that team up to be like, yeah, it was it was stacked. Like it was Marcus Hatton who played for the Pistons. It was Panelix, uh Georgia, who's my assistant. It was crazy. He's my teammate, but he's my assistant coach now. Uh, but like we had a BBL team, my captain, Dominic Johnson, uh, we had Andrew Warren, who literally, Andrew, love him to death. He's a coach for the Jazz now, assistant coach. He he shot eight threes a game and over a 55% clip. Like, we had that team. We really, we went literally 34 and two. Like, we were just cracking people that year. Um, we, we got the best record ever in the history of Pro A. So once we did that and once we accomplished our goal, it was like, let's move on to something new. And that's what I'm chasing currently. Uh, even though people say I'm a little ambitious, we're chasing the playoffs because I want to end my career with these guys the right way. Not through a basketball, but just with these guys. I want to, you know, close it out with something special. So, right. yeah, we all so, have. So, so you you win the title. You getting yourself ready for for the season back in the BBL, and then bam, August two two thousand seventeen hits, and you're diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. testicle cancer, right? Mm, oh, I had I had two tumors. I had one one of my the two of my lymph nodes, and then I had testicular cancer as well. I had okay. like three times. Um, but yeah, so yeah, so I mean, and then bam, that hits. Can you talk about like the effect it had on your on your life and walk us through like how you actually got diagnosed? Because that's not a, that's not an everyday diagnosis. Like you don't just go to a doctor and, mm -hmm. and they say, okay, this is what you have. So like, can you walk us through that that process? Well, when I caught cancer, it was so wild. So my auntie, Catherine Morris, uh, the reason I wear number seven, she passed on August 7th. Um, she had cancer. My grandma had cancer. Um, my sister and my mother didn't get it. Uh, it was just <laughs> it's so wild. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not the most spiritual person you'll meet. I believe in God, but I'm not spiritual like that. I pray to him like a normal person. Like, what's up, God? How you doing? Uh, but, you know, just came off my pro A season. Was ready to go to training camp the next day. Laying down, had pain all in my stomach. Just like couldn't, like couldn't sleep, move, couldn't move. Man, I had a dream. Something told me I had cancer. Just something, like something. So walk into practice. Can't make up. Walk into practice the next day. Menedictorix is there. All everybody's there. What up, Queen? What up, Q? Uh, walk in. We on the game after this, by the way. I play Fortnite. We, we, me, and my guys getting off. Uh, <laughs> Walked in and looked Coach dead in his face, and I said, "Yo, Coach, I got cancer, just like this. Like I got cancer, bro. Like I need to get checked out." Coach is like, "Excuse my language, you crazy shit." You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, the hell you got? You ain't got? You just average? Hey, you? Hey, you been practicing all week, killing? You ain't got no cancer, Coach. I need to get checked out before we go to this training camp. Wow. Martin Geisler calls me over at lunch. We have team lunch. Serge. We don't usually do this, but we're gonna get your mind checked out. Like get your get your body checked out so your mind is free. That way you can give everything at a you know, a training camp. Man, went to the first doctor, man, in less than five minutes. The doctor said, Yeah, you got a mass. I said, I got a mask, you got a mask. We're gonna take you to another doctor. I'm gonna send them right away. They type it up, they rush me through because I'm a basketball player. Lady doctor, she's pretty. Pretty late doctor, I'll never forget it. She's like, all right. So she checks she checks me out, and within the first two minutes, she says, you got cancer. We got surgery at 5 in the morning. We got to get this out. 
So woke up the next morning, had it. Had two more tumors. So they could other tumors to cut them out because if you know anything about cancer, if it's cancerous and it gets in your blood, it travels. So that's where the chemo came in to get the other two to go. And they had to take, of course, one of my, my testicles, but you know, it, it saved my life. So it was like, you know, like I, I'm just blessed to be here. I caught on fire from the neck down, almost died, have third degree burns on my leg. Don't know how I got out the burning building in Arlington. Uh, <laughs> blew my whole knee out. Live in Memphis, which you is not guaranteed to live another second. Uh, and I'm in the hood. Like, I'm in North Memphis. Like, I'm from the hood. So it's like, you know, all my boys are either on the corner or they making rap music or, you know, you know how that goes. So it's just like, like, yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's just like, like you know, I love y'all. I'm going to come check me out when I get home, but I'm not riding any cars. I ain't doing the, you know, but that's the thing about it. Like, people don't really understand, like, when you have a divine purpose, which I feel like this is, you're protected in certain areas and you know things. You got to trust your instincts. But yeah, man, they told me I had cancer. Surgery was the next day at five in the morning. They went in through my stomach, got it out, showed it to me. It was huge. They said it was, what is it? Is it malignant or benign? Whichever one the bad one was. They said it. Uh, and then I, I went straight into the chemo. I couldn't do chemo with the port because if you have a port, you have to keep it in for five days. Yeah. And uh, and if someone hits that, it could, you know, cause you damage. I took a needle. They ran a needle from the back of my ear all the way through my heart. Trying to sleep, the needle would sometimes pull out. So they'd have to come in and they'd have to re-stick it. I didn't sleep for two and a half weeks at a time because for 24 hours a day, they would have to change the stuff. So as soon as the chemo ran out, they have to put the insulin in. As soon as the insulin went out, they got to put the water in. So it's around. So no sleep, no nothing. I had heart murmurs. I kept calling my sister and my mom saying, Mom, I'm going to have a heart attack. Because my heart was murmuring. It was, it was, it was a, the thing, only thing about that is, and like I know I'm going to need counseling, and this is another thing we need to talk about. Because a lot of people, especially men that play overseas with anxiety and depression, we don't have an outlet as far as mental health goes. And that kills a lot of people. Um, we need to talk about it because I haven't, to talk about it with you, like I told George and them, I never processed my hurt of cancer because I was in the spotlight. I was big time. I was in the BBL. I was on the news stations. I was this because I'm playing through it. I'm fighting through it. I'm smiling through it. And no one could see what was behind it. And I had to keep this face on for everybody to see me smile. But nobody could see the tears that fell behind that closed door because once open that door, I'm like this, like, how you doing? You know, like, hey, like, because I knew it could help people. And and if you could help change perspective, you would sacrifice who you are to give someone else hope. At least that's how I'm raised. So, um, cool. yeah, man, and even process the whole cancer thing. Like, and, and that's so crazy. I took this so far behind and lived through it and fought through all the trials of trying to come back through and everything that I, I haven't processed it. I have I have not dealt with those issues of going through everything that I went through with that. It'll but probably yeah. happen when you're out of the spotlight. Yeah. Uh, when, when you're like, like, man, that was such a tough term. Like you're having to force yourself to eat food when you don't feel hungry. You're throwing up behind the door. You're getting poison, literally poison pumped yeah. every second of the day. You feel sick. You feel weak. You no family around. I was just, that's my, my next question. We keep going, but I, that's my next question. Andrew Warren was there for me. Benjo was there for me. That's why I love these boys to death. Today I die. But no one around you. Pumped with poison. Can't sleep. You know. You know how German hospitals are different from American hospitals. They're not the most comfortable. Uh, just you know, just going through it, man. Uh, and you really don't have anyone to cry to. You know, you don't you don't really have because you you you're raised as a man, you're raised to be strong, to not be emotionally vulnerable. You're raised to uh, you know, suck it up, step on Especially black men, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, so when you're going through a life or death situation and you you can't really call on people, then you're an eight hour time difference, nine hour time difference from where you are, you know, you you're dealing with all that by yourself and that's that's really tough. So that's that's the next point that I was gonna I was gonna get on because I, I that's the, the crazy thing about your story. Um my my first year overseas I broke my leg. 
um, two months after I got over here. I ended up staying and, and everything like that, but um, I couldn't go home and rehab. I had to stay here in rehab. And when I, when I heard about your story and then I realized that you actually got diagnosed here and you went through everything here without your family, that really hit me home because I was out here without my family and that was tough. I mean, I mean, that was my, I was 23 years old. I had, I had just gotten over. At least you, you had family or not family, but you had your teammates, you had extended friends and things like that that were here, but it's different than not having your family around you. And you got, like you said, the time difference, you got everything going on and they're not there to support you. How difficult was that? Not just for you, but also for your family to know that you are in a, a, a foreign country, you are miles and miles away and it's not that easy to get to you. And they've got to live with that as well, that they're also not there with you. How 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 did that kind of affect your relationship with your family? I mean, in that situation, your soul is broken. And this is being perfectly 100% honest. Like, we're going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it 100 Your soul is broken when you get diagnosed with cancer and you have no one yeah. around you. To um, you know, with, with that being said, man, like, I ain't gonna cry because I'm hoping I'm <laughs> suck it up, get back in there. Uh, but you know, just in general, like, to be a hundred, like, you're going through it alone. You know, you got your mom giving you encouragement, your sister giving you, you know, keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. But when you're going through something so painful by yourself, as a man, you have no one to talk to, and you are literally folding inside, breaking inside, and crumbling, you really want to give up. It was many nights that I was like, if I'm gonna have to go through this shit just to live, take the plugs out, forget basketball, forget this, I'm done. If it's my time, it's my time. And it got to that point to me to where I just really was like, yo, if it's my time, it's my time. Like, like if God wants to take me home and he got it, like, cause I'm not about to spend what time I might have left in here, you know what I'm saying? Like, if, it, if it's time for me to go, then I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna live my life. Because I had to go in, I think four times. I had to go in for two weeks at a time, four times, four cycles of chemo. So, yeah. And, and, and then already people are like, you're never gonna come back. You're not gonna be the same. Coach is like, oh, you don't plan to do this. Like, one thing about me is my whole career, I've proved people wrong. I've proved people wrong my whole career. So that was one of the motivating factors to help me do it too. But I still remember the days coming into practice and when I'm not supposed to touch a ball and I'm begging like the physio to let me in. I'm passing out, like blacking out. I went up and blacking out just to try and put a ball through a hole to prove to everybody it's bigger than me. You know what I'm saying? Like this ain't just for me. And I think that's what carried me through as well. Like knowing that it's people with other types of cancer, breast cancer, heart cancer, bone cancer, Stuff that they can't recover from, but I, me pushing through this little three tumors and, you know, a nut being gone, I might be able to inspire somebody that they got the, 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 the critical cancers where they don't even have a chance. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I basically put who I was aside to be like, all right, even if it is my time, maybe I could use this to help people, you know, in a special way. Um, but I broke down. I crumbled. Like, I, I gave up. Like, I I had this smile on, but I was, man, I was like, honestly, excuse my language, fuck this. Like, I'm, I'm out. Like, if it's my time to go, if it's my time to die, then, you know. And fuck. on that note, the question I have for you, or or the story I heard on Daniel George's uh, podcast, Ops Ball, shout out to Daniel, I know you're watching too, buddy, Love you. Um, is the story with you and, and Bene, Benedict. Um, Damn, he literally yo. threatened to, to take you out um, if you didn't, you were at that low, you were at that low point you just talked about and how a teammate can, can inspire you and literally like say, no, we, we doing this together. We, I'm going to take you there. You, we, we doing this. And that's, that's the brotherhood that, that not many people understand, but especially in your situation, having somebody to say like, no, this is the way it is. We're going to go through this. You're going to do this. How, how Man, big, like can you tell that story, please? Man, I'm a, I'm a love Ben Joe for life. Like I told him, me and I had one year we got into it because we're playing the same team and stuff. And I just, I'm a love him for life, man. Like, he's playing for, um, for Where Brunswick. Where I'm at. So proud of him. Love him to death. Got it. Got his picture at my house. Uh, they say man's best friend is his dog. My dog is named Ben Joe. Like, real talk. Like, mm -hmm. I can't make this up. Him and Andrew Warren. 
And, uh, you know, I told you, I gave up on life. I said I was done with, with, with life, and I, was, I wasn't going back in for an appointment. For, literally, you cannot sleep for two weeks. You feel the poison going through your throat, into your heart. Um, your needles are coming out your neck. Like, every time you wake up, the lady has to come back in, call the doctor to restick your neck, to shove the needle. You feel it go in. On top of that, I got a torn hip. I can't sleep. I took a sleeping pill. I fell out of the bed one day, face first, on the ground like a fish, and I can't get anything can't move because my body's paralyzed from the sleep but like stories bro and i was just like i'm not doing three more cycles of this shit i'm like it's it's a wrap like you know like i wanted to give up after the first cycle i'm not doing this shit no more because I, I had to get a two so i got a two break between each cycle because they can't pump you full of it continuously because it's going to kill you like it's going to destroy you and uh man benjo benjo came to me and benjo was like you going back and I'm from, I'm like, nigga, I'm from Memphis. I'm like, you ain't gonna make me go back. Like, we about to, you know, we about to shoot the fade. What, what's up? No, you going back. Like, we, we about to fight, but you going, in the end of the day, you know, I'm gonna whip your ass, you gonna mine, but we going back. And uh, broke down crying. He looked me in the eyes and, uh, you know, hugged me and got me back in there, man. Like, I really wouldn't have made it. I gave up, bro. Like, I was out. Like, I was out of that. Um, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't gonna make it through cancer if it wasn't for my my guys. I think. You know? I think. Um, no one can fully understand what you went through. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you tell the story. I'm affected by it. My mother and my father both passed from cancer, mm -hmm. um, and mother-in-law is sick right now from it. And and man, uh, I have a history with it, but mm -hmm. I cannot even imagine what you went through during that time and i think that's that's a testament to your will and you and, and your strength man that you that you went through it and and didn't give up you know it's it, that's 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 i think that's a under the understatement of the year when when someone says that you you've been through it you know yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. so I, it's crazy man i just i it, that that hits me hard as well but i know i i, I can't even imagine i can't even fathom um what that what that must have been like how long uh -huh. was it go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. if you've ever seen harry potter which i know a lot of people are harry potter friends fans stuff you see like when a dementor sucks the life out of harry you literally felt that literally the life being sucked out of you every day like you you the thing is this if you ever seen someone who's went through the stages of cancer they usually have their hair at first their hair falls out they usually have a glow at first they become pale you literally are seeing the life being sucked out of you through this treatment. Um, you, you, I was just a shell of myself at one period. Like I, even though if you ask my, my teammates, it was like I was going bald anyway. I, I had some curls, <laughs> but pick up and your hair falls off, and your eyebrows just fall off, and your mustache and your beard just gone. One day, just wake up and and to see you becoming skinnier and your body shrinking and. And you can't do anything about it, no matter how much you eat, you're throwing it up. You can't keep it down. You, 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 you're the living dead, you know? Um, and, and, and you have to find a new level of self just to try to compete or, or to try and make it through that. Because a lot of people do give up when they have cancer. And I was just like, use that to tell people they don't have to give up, you know? How long did it take from diagnosis till you were on the court without restrictions? <clears throat> I said, well, I, I did some shit no one ever did with that shit. I came back. I was diagnosed in August, like December. I came, I came back August. So you were diagnosed August and Early. December you were back on the court? Treatments. And I, I was back on the court. I think I played my first game. It was My first game was against Geeson. And I got a stand ovation of over like 5,000 fans. And I want to say that was like... Like almost like January, January fifteenth, like like between that era. But do it. Like they were like, there's no way you're playing this season. We're gonna. I'm like, nigga, you can't tell me what I'm gonna do. I already made it through it. Like only God got control of the rest of it. So uh, like I told you, I was working. I was working in the gym till I literally I blacked out a couple times. Was throwing out, throwing up, and then the thing was the thing that kept me going in that point in time was everybody told me I would never come back as good of a player as when I left. And that's what made me go loco. Because I was like this. I'm like, if God going to give me this story to tell, I'm about to be that man because I'm going to tell it. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure they see this story happen. So uh, 
Yeah, that's what pushed me through because I had my coaches were telling me, you ain't coming back. Like, you're not going to be a good player. Like, we already got your – now, you ain't got no damn replacement for me. You're going to have to deal with what, what you got. Like, you're going to have to deal with me and, and what I'm bringing to the table. I think my third game in, I had 27 and 7 against Ohm, a prime Ohm. You know, and, and they were like, Sergio, you're only – I got the interview right now. I can send it to you. They are like, Sergio, you're only – what he said, like only like a half a month out of chemo, and this is this, and you had 27. I'm like, man, look, they knew what I could do. God is behind me, like, who against me? And uh, that was one of the things that was really, like I told you, when people underestimate me, it just it pushes me harder because I fought through so much. It's like, you can't tell me, I'm not, well, I'm supposed to be here, I have a purpose, so you can't tell me you a man, like, I listen to him, I don't listen to you, you know, so. But yeah, that was a, that was that was a that was a hell of an experience, man. And I'm okay, four, three, 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 three. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think I'm four or three years in remission now. I think yeah, I think I'm four or three years in remission. So, so obviously you made a, a, a great comeback. Um, what does what does 2022 Sergio say to 2017 Sergio? Mm. You. Manage your money better. <laughs> Manage your money. What uh? What did he say? Count your chickens. Count your chickens. <laughs> money better is the first thing that he says. But the second thing is, you did it in the sense that you are loved by so many people and you touched so many people that you would never know personally. That you created some type of change in the world. Not just in yourself, but in the world. You've influenced people in America, people in Germany, people in Europe. You get standing O's whenever you go somewhere. Hey, you did it. You did something. Like every time, this time every time I judge, like you did something that people spend their whole careers chasing. Chasing. Don't get. You know, and, and you've done this and you're still not through. You still stepping. Like you you still are just as good as a player. You can still have a 25 point game in a second. You're not through yet. You know, like like this is this is the first part of the story. So if I could tell my young self anything, it would just be like, smile every day, live every moment like it's your last, sure. because you a society and love. Don't be afraid to tell your friends that are guys, I love you, or your your women, I love you, because it's not enough of that going around. It's a lot of hate going around. It's a lot of bad stuff going around, but it's not enough love going around. So to have cancer and be cancer. And, do all this stuff. What up, campaign? That's campaign. My man from back home. You know, y'all might know him from the Phoenix Suns. Um, what's up, Cam? But you you go through so much, and AJ, of course, love AJ too. But you go through so much when you had cancer, bro. Like I would just tell myself, like, love your people, believe in yourself, and 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 you know, just just know that it's bigger than you at times. You you touch so many people, so so tell your story. So if. Those of you don't, that don't know, the city of Weissenfels is very, very small. It's in yeah. East Germany. It's, um, it's, a, it's a small community, but with rabid fans, okay? Um, and the city of Weissen, Weissenfels has embraced you like few athletes um, have ever experienced. And I also played in East Germany when I played in Jena, um, and I won a title and moved, moved up. So there's some parallels there. And so I can understand I can understand just what you're, what you're going through out there. Um, and I'm probably one of the few people that can ask you this question and, and know exactly what you're going to say. What is different about playing and and being a successful black athlete in an East German city? What is the significance of that for you? Well, you know, like when I was coming here, I have German family too. The the mm -hmm. beautiful lady, uh, I'm honest, I think, who saved my life when I caught on fire from the neck down. And, um, and uh, her daughter, who I love to death, their family are coming to stay out here with me and everything. But they used to call Eastern Germany Donker Deutschland, which means dark Germany. Um, it's supposed to be very racist, very, you know, high area. And I mean, and, and, and we're just being perfectly honest because we, we're 100 about everything. When you walk by in Germany as a black person, you see so many heads turn and stare. You see them shoot and they do not look away. Like they will stare you into a hole. <laughs> um, to be as welcomed as I was with this color of skin is not something that a lot of people get. Um, but I think my personality and the way I treat people and how welcoming I am to people, 
it helped it a lot. Like a lot of people became fans really quickly because I wasn't just the guy that would be like, hey, look kid. I was like, man, tell your kid, come over here and sit on the lap, you know, let him be this. My personality helped with a lot of that. But, you know, I, I haven't received that racism yet. Like they're, they're putting up a black man's jersey in the BBL in Eastern Germany. Like how many people can you say have done that? Maybe Darius Hall maybe or 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 somebody like that or uh, Julius Jenkins and Jenkins wasn't Jenkins was Berlin. So right, you know, right. you got a lot of people that's been able to accomplish it. And I'm and the crazy thing is like I told you, I'm still not through. I still got like two or three more years to play somewhere. But the thing is just, you know, it's it's a very rare case because if you know anything about this part of Germany is really the the part that's more so swept under the rug. It's the part that they, you know, um, and uh, you know, I, I've had a few instances where my teammates were where racism was kind of prevalent. Or you know, one time a guy tried to stick stick me and my teammate uh, Anthony Cow with the with the knife. Um, you know, you have a few things like that 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 do happen. Uh, it's, it's not sweet, but. For the, for the most part, these seven years, I've been loved, and every time people see me, even though they are usually of a different complexion, uh, you know, they, they run up to me, and the old ladies touch me, and the white ladies, hey, and the, and the other women want to hug me, and the, the children just, oh, Sergio, like, can we get a picture? You know, like, I've been blessed to do that. And then another thing is I have really great sponsors in Etika, uh, Dennis and Claudia, and, and they have a cutouts of a black man in the top grocery store. So you have a six foot cut out of me. I'm on the face of everything. They're my sponsor, and and they they push me out there to their audience, and they embrace me. Like I walk in the grocery no. store, just people come in like, "Hey, Sergio, would you? We got a deal. Like you want to come back in the back and talk?" I'm like, "I come back and talk." Like, you know, I just walk through the store. I go behind the desk. I've, I've been cashier for them before. I've actually done cashiering for them before. Ring up people's groceries when they need me. So, you know, it's just like. I, I found like when I say I found my home, I found my home. I, I was I was blessed to be able to come. Now, I'm not gonna say the face because I don't want to be cocky, but one of the faces of this organization and, and most people that associate in the BBL, Centennial CBC, they associate with me. You know, so I'm, I'm blessed in that. You know, black face in Eastern Germany is that's why I said my whole story feels like it's been crafted from fire to getting kicked out of the league to making big money to having Euro League teams want me to being a top five Euro Cup player to ending up in Vice and Fellows after cancer, after fire, after this. It was it was a story that was really guided and crafted. You know what I'm saying? To be like, okay, you're here. So I'm excited for the next next page of that story. I mean, I had three amazing years in Jena and I have to say that I didn't face any kind of racism or, or anything like that, zero. There were some 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 arches or things like that that got shut down from people who were against it, um, demonstration stuff like that. But I always wondered. Okay, I'm six eight, right? You can tell I'm the way I walk, the way I talk, the where how I dress, I'm my the skin color. You can tell I'm an athlete, right? There's no yeah. mistake in that. So I used to always wonder what it was like for a person who's not my size, just a normal black guy, average height, um, because I kind of saw myself a little bit as, as excuse the phrase, but like a house Negro. Like, I was yeah. good enough because I was an athlete, but yeah, there's some place I might not want to head, head to, right? But but I, 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 I myself never, never experienced that, so I was a little bit in, in, ignorant, for lack of a better word, for how it would be for just an everyday black guy living in Yena. Uh, but you, you, you're loved there. You know, I was loved there. I, I, like I said, I never had any problems, and and um, it's just it's just weird to 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 look back on it in those times. And 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 I'm way older than you, and it was a little bit different back then too. You know, um, and yeah, it's just amazing to, to to that's a testament also to your personality to how how loved you are. You know, you said. You know, you grab fans, you know, you take pictures, you, you, don't, you don't just say, hey, and sign a name or sign a T-shirt, but you actually interact. And I think that's one of the key things that um, not a lot of people really understand, whether you're in Germany, whether you're in Weissenfels, Jena, or Berlin. It's, if your personality is not such as that, it's going to be tough. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell, tell people something, and, and this is the athletes are watching, and, and y'all can agree with me. It's not, you know, 13 people are watching. We need to have like 700, but it's cool. Listen. 
when you play overseas, it's more than just the game of basketball. Yes, sir. A lot of people don't understand that. When you play overseas, it's more than the game of basketball. Basketball is your end. You get what I'm saying? Like it's, and I'm speak, we're about to speak like you flipping bricks. Basketball is your end. It gets you through the door. What keeps you in the door is what you have after you put that ball in the goal. Thank you. If if you don't if you don't have, I'm from Memphis, so I told you I got black ball, and and even out here I I, I speak German now to a level to where I can understand and I can speak expressly Deutsch, just a schleck, but I, I speak it pretty Sehr solid. Sehr good. Yeah. Normal is a kind of problem. but I speak it pretty good. So when that racism thing came, what I used to do was because people, when I got blackballed, people used to talk about me like, "Oh, this is the Swatzer man, the black man," and this. And they say really racist stuff, and this is the poem. So the woman I told you to save me, I would go to their house, and I was just, I got so mad at people talking noise and no one is talking about me. We're about to eat. I'm like, what am I eating? Say it in German. Now this is Hanchen. Okay, so I eat. I'm like, can I have a Hanchen? You know, what am I eating with? A mess and gavel. Can I have a hanchen and can I have a mess and gavel to eat it with? You know, and I started piecing together words until one day I walked into a locker room and they were saying some real wild racist wild shit. And I and I hit I hit the ass back with that shit in Germany. I'm like, now what's up? Like let's let's throw hands because I know exactly what you said. <laughs> I, I'm speaking back to you. So let's see how this rocks. They got so scared. They were looking for the police. I said, because I, I was a high head. I come from Memphis. I was a high head. I was like, all right, you're going to talk noise. We're going we gonna to test this. Um, but as I was saying, like, that gets a lot of athletes kicked out of Europe. You can be the best player in the world, but if you got a fucked up attitude That's and you eat basketball, you will not be there long. These people do no. not care. At the end of the day, basketball is a business. And that's why one thing, even though I love it here in Bison Fellas, it's a business. At any point in any given time in any day, they could say, guess what? Your usefulness is done. Yeah. If they say that, I'm up here looking like, but I was loyal to you. Dude, it's a business. Yeah. They can move you like a product. Yeah. What happens when most athletes don't achieve come January? They ass is gone and they bring in a new player. So, so you got to find your niche because one thing I learned in this, and I'm not about, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm get these people. I'm honest. When you become friends with the sponsors, and that's not why I did it, and you become a fan favorite that people chant your name at the game, Karush is on fire, chant it if you're not getting in the game. You've made yourself bigger than what some people can do to you. Because think about this, if they send a person home who is the face, the this, the that, the boom, question is going to be asked. If they start losing, then they on that ass. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, and I'm not, it's not why I did it, it's just my natural personality to be like this, and I went through cancer here. Make yourself bigger than the game. Make yourself untouchable. Make yeah. yourself irreversible. Make yourself a necessity. Because guess what? You can still be great, but you're going to have coaches that don't agree with you eventually if you change coaches. Coaches that ain't going to play your ass eventually because they don't see your worth, even if everyone else does. You're going to have all these things to deal with. So at the end of the day, you want some type of power behind you to where you can sit here and say, like I said, this Dennis, this is one of my sponsors. He's one of my great friends, and that's one of the people I was telling you about. You want people that believe me and people behind you where if someone says, oh, he's not this, they're going to be like, yes, he is. Like, back, what's wrong right? You got you got some power, you know, because these teams I've seen teams discard people like they are nothing. Like tissue, like six players in a week, but bring an extra player without telling the player they're bringing to replace him, and just hit the dude. Like, can you imagine? You have seen that Spider Man man where they're all pointing at each other like this. <laughs> walk into the locker room and see three Americans like this. And <laughs> You know, yeah, he's going to be like, oh, you knew. Oh, you knew. Like, Who's playing? Who like, for? Yeah, then coach come in. He's like, hey. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, How many Americans can we have on this team? Yeah. yeah. That, <laughs> that happened where people come in and, 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 and just sit in people's locker room. Like, oh, shit, we got a new guy here. That, you know what I'm saying? Because it's a business. You are a number to 
people. If you're not helping these people win, if you are not, and, you, and the crazy thing is you can be holding your own. You can be averaging 25 and 10. You can be one of the most amazing players. But if you're not buying into that concept and causing them problems with your attitude, and you're not helping them win, or the Speak. coach don't like it, they Speak, shit out. And, and I think that's why a lot of us get, get so mentally messed up as athletes, the younger generation. Man, I'm hooping. I'm I'm doing this. I'm doing Help. what else you bring to the table. Think so if you think think of think of basketball like a marriage. You marry her because she's pretty. They marry you because you look good. You got money. But after that, what's on the inside that's gonna keep that relationship working? Because yeah. eventually if you don't find something else different, you're gonna get a divorce. And that's the same thing it is in basketball, getting a divorce. They're going to scoot your ass out. And then another thing is people don't understand, too, when they play for lower-level teams, how they can average 30 points and 10 rebounds and this and still can't find a job the next year because your ass didn't win. You can average 10 points, three rebounds, and win, and you will go make a million dollars. Compared to average. You make a million dollars, yo. And your ass can't make five. Yep. Yep. So – it's, it's, it's a lot of game to this. Like, you got to know how to. There's levels. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm from Memphis, making easy money, pimping, blank, and style. This is what it stands for. <laughs> you got to have game on and off the court. You got to be a good person on and off the court. It's a, it's a lot of things that our young guys aren't getting. And even some of our older guys that have been here, they, they're not getting it because they think it's only about talent. But it's about being more than just a player. But you learn that when you get out by a job by a guy who only averages half of your points and is nowhere near your skill level. That's when you learn. I think like a lot of guys haven't learned the lesson of that yet. And that's why we have so many athletes. I trained with NBA guys. I was in SF this summer. My trainer was on here, Alex, and then like I was with a lot of the Santa Cruz guys. <laughs> Y'all sitting at home right now. Not because you're not talented. But because you might have got an attitude or you might not be coachable or you or you, you don't you you, you you're too cool. Down. Yeah, you you're too cool to, 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 to sign an autograph and be a good person. You know, I'm, I'm here for basketball. Like you know, it's just one aspect of it. It's just one aspect of it, man. Like like that's just one aspect. That's gonna that's gonna get your foot through the door. You gotta be able to hoop to get through the door in Europe. How low are you? You gotta be able to hoop. You I mean, you can't tell me Germany's probably what third or fourth best league in the world. I say ACB's one. I say maybe Turkey, France is two or something like that. And then we're third. You got to get your foot in the door by being able to hoop. But after that, when you start going down in age, getting older and stuff, what's going to keep you successful? What's going to keep you mentioned in household names? What's going to keep you? I've had the BBL do me to do with me for seven years. And they tell me every year, like, it's because you're the most entertaining personality in the BBL. Like, like we love you. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like coach could not play you a minute, but we gonna love you. You know what I'm saying? Like this, like you know. So it's just it's about finding, like you said, I call it niche, but my mom says niche like you do. So, but <laughs> tomato, tomato. But you know, it's about finding your spot and, and and being true to who you are, and 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 being able to share who you are and perform at the same time, and that's what keeps you at a high level. I got. That was great, man. That was great stuff. I got a couple more questions for you before I, I, I let you get out and get some sleep or, or go play Call of Duty or whatever you're going to do. Quick <laughs> questions. I'm going to put you on the spot right away. From the, three teams, from the three teams that you've played for in Germany, NBC, mm. Quackenbrook, Bremerhaven, mm. kiss, kill, marry. Who do you kiss? Who do you kill? Who do you marry? Oh, Arlen Day. Arlen Day to the win. <laughs> Arlen, Arlen is like Michael Myers on Friday the 13th, dude. Y'all <laughs> done. Arlen is out of there. Um, okay, who you kissing and who you marrying? So I'm going to marry a contract that I didn't sign. I'm going to marry Bember. If I go back to the three, I'm going to marry Bember. But you didn't play in Bember. I'm talking about the, 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 the teams you played for. So now you got uh, you got uh, Bremerhaven and NBC. Uh, yes. They offered me a, a three-year deal after my year, but I just wasn't going to play in the Mully Cat Serian. Some Serbian coaches, like, you know, different type of yeah. coaches you get. I had a coach, and they're they going to run your knees into the ground, and I just wasn't about to have that. He he messed me up when we lost. So it was the last game of the season, and we lost by 30 to Berlin. Last game of the season, everybody want to go home. We go home in the next three days. <laughs> he called a practice. 
he made us run around literally for an hour and a half until like my American Jerry Smith, uh, DeAndre Liggins, who uh, played in the NBA, they were like, man, elf that last check. <laughs> <laughs> <Ow. laughs> so, at, at that point, I knew I wasn't going back to play for him. <laughs> So, so I'd marry, I'd marry, uh, I'd marry QB, uh, you know, I'd marry them. But, but uh, Grandma Hoffa gets a, a kiss, and then we need some distance. <laughs> Got you. It's, it's Got like you. your friend acting a little crazy. You look crazy, baby. <laughs> so Arlen getting all over the day. It's Arlen getting all over the day. <laughs> uh, which actor, dead or alive, plays you in a movie? Yeah, I'm gonna go with the job. I like. I feel like I look like Morris Kojo or Chris Brown. <laughs> I'm gonna look Chris Okay, Ryan. okay, I'm I'm like, Morris. I got you. Yeah, um, young actress. Um, what interaction with a fan has moved you the most in your career? Okay, so this is before I had cancer. Uh, it's this little kid named Dalton, and he's from West Kentucky, and. Um, he had like, he was part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And this is back when I was the top prospect um, for the NBA. His Make-A-Wish was to spend a day with me. He had cancer at the age of like four. And he's now playing in high school, but he's still bald as an egg. And uh, I remember when I first met him, because I was still the same person, he hid underneath the table and cleaned onto the leg of the table. And me being me, I was like, man, I'm not about to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm about to go out here and chase this kid. But I looked at underneath, and he, he, he was a young, bald, white boy, and he just was like, you know, sickly looking. He had my jersey on, and he's more like, there's Sergio, you know. And I said, man, I'm about to go get this kid. So I get on my knees and in, 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 in my arms, and I crawl underneath the table to, you know, mess with him. And I'm joking with him and mess with him. And he gives me a hug and he's like, I love you. Like, you're my hero. And they sit on, we play Vanderbilt the next day. They're ranked number two, I think, or three. We just beat the number three team. And I'm killing and we're all killing at that time. And he's sitting front row and he got a big oversized Sergio jersey on. Can't see the man's feet. And it's, I put my hand on his head, like palm his ball head. And I just told him, like, man, like, you are an inspiration to me. That's why he had my cancer, you know, and 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 that's that's one thing the one of the most interaction. But after that, it was when everyone come to me with cancer. After I told my story of cancer, and it was out in the news. They would come to me with cancer, and like people would just grab me from behind and hug me. And I'm like, why are you hugging me? Like you know, in like a really empathetic voice. And they were like, uh, they were like, you don't understand how it feels to have cancer and not know someone that's fighting. Like what we're fighting, and I think those brought tears to my eyes because you have people come to you every game, like talking about some. You are part of my reason for pushing because I watched you push through. That's why me and George and all them and stuff are working on something special for the people because I think that the true story behind everything needs to be told, um, and they feel the same. But uh, yeah, like those are the best interactions I have, and it happens every game I play. Like, because if you know anything about Germany, we have our derbies in this. Right. When you go to a country who's your, I mean, not a country, when you go to a team that's your derby and you get a stand ovation and people are surrounding you after to hug you from an opposite team, they hate with their passion, you know, and, and, and love you and just really be like, you know, like you are special. Like you changed my life. And like I was, or just people come like, you know, I was fighting with cancer. I couldn't tell anybody I had cancer and you were going through it. And, you know, just those type of stories themselves, those, those are the reason I keep doing this and keep telling this story. Cause like I told Dane, I'm like, I'm not ready. To, when Dane first came to me about this, even last year, I said, I'm not ready to talk about this yet, bro. Like I ain't dealt with it. And to, to talk about it every time is to relive it. Cause I haven't processed it. So, uh, you know, that was the thing behind it, talking about that cancer and, and letting that cancer be known and, and this. And, man, those are some of the most expression things I ever had when people just love me and tell me, like, thank you for helping me get through my cancer. Or my mama had cancer. Or my sister died from cancer. And it was such a tough thing, you know, because everyone, nine times out of ten, everyone's had some type of dealing right. with this. Like like you said, like, rest in peace, your mom and your dad, you know? Somebody's had an interaction with it. So for me to share mine and let it be on display it helps those people who have been through something dealing with it or family members have had it or anything. So those are the most touching interactions I get.
I, I, that's a, a great note to end the interview with, man, because I, I, I really appreciate you putting it out there. I know you said before that you haven't really processed it. And like you just said, you, you telling it is reliving it. So I, I really appreciate you putting yourself out there and, and, and giving, giving that to my, to my little program here. And uh, yeah, I got one last thing for you, man. Before I let you get out of here, I got this thing called the, t the call out where, I asked the guest, the current guest, you in this case, um, to call somebody out who you think would be a good fit for the show. Oh. Uh, so you you call somebody out, and then I'll contact them and send them a portion of this video, that which you calling them out, so that I get quality guests on this show. Should they be American? They have to be American? It can be anybody, an agent. It can be a player. It can be anybody involved um, in basketball that you think would be a good fit for the show. Cause he's not he's not gonna know I'm a fan of him. We played against each other a lot of years, and he's the guy who, when I gave up the contract at Bremerhaven, he took it. He made a name for himself, Bremerhaven. He plays for um, for Harco Merlins now. He's another German guy. Um, actually, I got two. Uh, well, no, he doesn't have a story like that. But his name is Fabian Black, and he's dealing. He has five diabetes, or he's dealt with diabetes for a long time. And me coming from cancer, I just think that the next natural step is to talk with somebody else who did. Because a lot of people have a problem with diabetes. Yeah. Um. So, so Fabian, hello, my friend. This is Sergio, and uh, yeah, it must do the next for the call out. So. To be, to be strong, Florida. I, I, I'm gonna hit him up. I'm gonna hit him up and tell, tell him you you called him out. So, man, I took up enough of your time, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for 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 being my guest and being on today. I think I think, like I said at the beginning, if you're not inspired by this story, then you are in the total wrong place because that's what this show is all about and um, inspiring people, informing and, and entertaining them as well. But um, I, I appreciate you 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 taking the time out, man. I can't say it enough and and keep balling, man. Keep 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 on thank keeping you. on, man. Repping that's Memphis and, and doing your thing, man. Long revenge. This is redemption season, baby. Time to time to add a couple I'll be, points. I'll be watching. I'll be watching. I'll, I'll shout you out sometimes too. So I'll be I'll be making sure I, I get the the, the surge show um, when yeah. you come to town here in Braunschweig as well. So all right, make sure. We'll see you, all right, all right, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Right. Well, everyone, teammates, thank you again for uh, tuning in. Whether you were here for one minute or for the whole what hour and hour and nine minutes now um i thought that was a great show very inspiring to me as well and i'll be sure to, to hook up with him when he gets out here to to brown try to play against the Lurf. um yeah that's it i think that was a a great ending and um yeah i hope everybody tunes in next week if you're a, a new person that they just came across the 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 show, the Eurostep. Um, I hope to see you back again. If you're one of the oldies that's been around, what is this, my 38th, 39th episode, then I appreciate you, and I hope to see you around even more. Next week, I'll have another another guest that's a little bit, I don't want to say too much, but a little bit outside the world of basketball, but it's a, a pretty cool connection to basketball as well. So um, I hope everybody will check in, in, in for that next week. And, yeah, that's it for me. Everyone be safe as usual. Thank you very much for tuning in. Okay, now.